You know, there's a whole lot of buzz right now. A whole lot of buzz right now about this guy. About this guy. They called him Elvis the Pelvis. Elvis the Pelvis. And his biopic right now is the most successful movie. It's the most successful movie by far in the United States. People are going crazy over Elvis, even though he's been dead since August 16, 1977. People are going crazy about Elvis. Elvis the pelvis. I always substitute for the S, the dollar sign. Elvis, the pelvis. He made a lot of money. He made a lot of people happy. Take your Bible today and open with me to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians. We're going to be continuing the series that we began recently from the great book of Ephesians, the book of Philippians by the Apostle Paul. We are going through verse by verse, phrase by phrase, even word by word, expositing and exegeting the Word of God correctly and accurately to the glory of God that you might be, number one, evangelized, number two, exhorted, and number three, edified. You don't need Elvis and Hollywood or entertainment. You need edification, exhortation, evangelism, and comfort. I, uh, about a year ago, I preached a message about Elvis. And the scene is not a happy scene. The scene is eternal, everlasting, burning hell. And since I preached that message that was called Burning Love, or Elvis Presley leads the Hellfire Choir, <laughs> I have added tens of thousands, I don't exaggerate, tens of thousands of new followers. And many of those who are new don't have the time or don't take the time to go all the way back in the archives and rewind to, to the beginning and watch all the old messages. So sometimes, every once in a while, the Lord leads me to dig up one of those old messages that are still anointed because truth doesn't change and truth is eternal and preach it for a new audience of new followers. So with this movie going crazy right now and Top Gun going crazy with Tom Cruise, I just felt like I should talk about it again. But I want to, first of all, I want to read my text, and we're going to go all the way back to the 10th verse of Philippians chapter 1 in our context, but for our main text, I want us to start reading with verse 21 of Philippians chapter 1. Paul says, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Oh my, think about that. For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. What I shall choose, I wot not. For I am in a strait betwixt two. No, he's not talking about George Strait. <laughs> no, he says, I'm in a strait betwixt two. George Strait is not the king. He can really sing. George Strait can really sing, but he's not the king. Jesus is the king. Elvis was not the king. Jesus is the king. For I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know I shall abide and continue with you for all your furtherance and joy of the faith. Let's pray as we begin today. Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, this beautiful set, this beautiful stage, this beautiful setting outdoors just outside Washington, D.C. If I had a good throwing arm, Lord, I could throw into the Potomac River right over there. Lord, we thank you for another opportunity to gather around your holy, inspired, 
infallible and inerrant word. Now, Lord, we ask that the teacher, the mighty Holy Ghost, would come and anoint us to teach the truth. God, and make my tongue as of the pen of a ready writer and anoint these people to hear. And God, we pray, Lord, above all, that this be done to the praise of the glory of your grace. That we give you all the glory for everything said, done, wrought, and accomplished in this service today. Now, Lord, pour out your spirit. Hallelujah, Lord. To the north, to the south, to the east and the west. God, send your laborers and pour out your spirit, O oh God to every nation, kindred, tongue, tribe, language, and people that this last great harvest can be gathered in. Come, Lord Jesus. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. We ask these things today in the precious name of Jesus. And everybody said amen. And amen. Now, entertainers do not look at things the way Paul did. Paul said, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. People in the flesh, sinners in the world, they don't look at death as a promotion. They don't look at death as the victory. They look at death as a defeat. But those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ know that we're not living for this life right here, right now. Our reward, our blessing, our home is in heaven. We are strangers and aliens and pilgrims to this world. And we prefer the Word of God, amen, to the world. And to a true believer, this world has nothing to offer. But you see, Elvis and people like the ones I'm fixing to talk about, they were all about the world and, and money and fame and celebrity and stardom. They wanted to be worshipped. They wanted to be praised. They wanted to be applauded. They wanted you to stand up and give it up for them and treat them like little gods. Well, the thing is, it's appointed unto man once to die and after this, the judgment. It doesn't matter how much money you made or how famous you were or what kind of celebrity you were. And we could talk about Prince. We could talk about Heath Ledger. We could talk about Whitney Houston. We could go right on down the line and talk about celebrity after celebrity after celebrity. Judy Garland, who died at a young age, Michael Jackson. We could go right on down the line, John Lennon, and delineate name after name so there's no way that I'll cover them all but as we begin today you got to forget about George Strait forget about all that and find the straight and the narrow way Elvis the pelvis who shook his booty who gyrated suggestively who tantalized and led an entire generation of women to lust, who went against the morals and the virtues of society, led this nation to moral perversion. The sexual revolution that would follow was a revolt and a rebellion against Almighty God. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll are perversion. They're not the way of the Bible. They're not the way of God. They are not Christian. And yet Elvis, who knew better, he was a Pentecostal, assemblies of God, raised in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. But he rebelled against all that. And he wanted to do the one thing that Pentecostals couldn't do. He, he wanted to be a movie star. He wanted to be the star. He wanted to be the one getting the praise. That doesn't fly with God. Those of you that watched my videos now from New Orleans, my first apartment in New Orleans was actually the, the setting for the movie King Creole where Elvis lived in the movie King Creole. I know a little bit about Elvis. I've been to Graceland. My dad raised me to be the biggest Elvis fan in the world before I was saved. Amen. Y'all pray for my dad. He's bravely battling dementia and Alzheimer's. But he raised me to be a huge Elvis fan. So when I talk about Elvis Presley, <laughs> I'm not talking about something that I don't know about. I'm talking about something that's near and dear to the heart of evangelist Mike Dye. I was 10 years old when Elvis died. I cried like a baby. I cried like a baby because my dad raised me to love him. So I'm not just the casual observer of Elvis or a casual Elvis fan. I know most of his songs by heart. <laughs> and if... Uh, if you push me, I can do a pretty good Elvis impersonation. But that's not what I'm on here for. That's not why, that's not my purpose. 
I want to take you to the dungeons of the damned, to the underworld, to the world of those who are doomed in eternal fire, everlasting fire, hellfire and brimstone, out of darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. There are many musicians, and Elvis the Pelvis is not the king in hell, but I do think he leads, and I'm being facetious here, you understand where I'm going. I'm trying to reach you, but I'm being serious at the same time. I think he leads the Hellfire Choir. And you know, one of the songs that he and Frank Sinatra and Judy Garland and Prince and Michael Jackson and all the others who are there are doing, he leads the Hellfire Choir <laughs> in the only song that Elvis is allowed to perform for all eternity. Anybody have any guesses what that is? It's not Hound Dog. It's not All Shook Up. It's not Don't Be Cruel. The one song that Elvis is allowed to do and will do for all eternity, a million years from now, a billion years from now, a trillion years from now, he will do it. He'll be doing this. Well, I'm a hunk of hunk of burning love. Well, I'm a hunk of hunk of burning love. I'm just a hunk of hunk of burning love. I'm just a hunk of hunk of burning love. And look, I don't mean to, to shock you or be so staggering that you turn me off. But I want you to think about the circumstances of the man's death. The man died, a divorced man, living with another girl, Ginger Alden, that was not his wife, living in perpetual fornication, pornea. The man died a hopeless drug addict, prescription pills from Dr. George Nicopolis. And the man died. <laughs> they say he died on the toilet. The king died on his throne. The, the man died wanting to go back and be a movie star, but he couldn't do it. The man died a glutton. A caricature. Oh, we can still sing. But that's about all. People who die in that state, ladies and gentlemen, do not go to heaven. If you've ever listened to a preacher, you better listen to me right now. They go to hell. And so Elvis and the Hellfire Choir, I'm sure they take requests. <laughs> and there's a woman whose name is Cher, she's not dead yet, and y'all should listen to me sharing the gospel and not Cher singing. But there's a song that she does in all of her concerts and all her shows that I think the Hellfire Choir is doing, and they're doing it because they want to do it, and it expresses the desire. You see, hell will be full of regrets. I can see Frank Sinatra in hell saying, regrets, I had a few, yeah. In hell, you have a lot of regrets. Why? Because in hell, time is only a concept. And in hell, forever is a very long time. And there's no second chances. There's no reincarnation. There's no soul sleep. There's no nirvana. It's eternal torture. Eternal torture. Read Revelation chapter 14, if you don't believe me. Read Revelation chapter 20. Read the four gospels of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hell is real. And hell is literal. I'm not trying to scare you, or, or maybe I am. There's a lot of people going around today saying, oh, God's not mad at you. God's not angry at you. Look, if you're, if you're outside the provision of the blood of the cross, he's very angry at you. He's very mad at you. And he's going to burn you forever in hell. So you shouldn't preach that way. You shouldn't preach that turn and burn stuff, Brother Mike. Well, look, if I didn't, then I'd be lying to you. If I didn't, I'd be denying the truth. So Elvis and the Hellfire Choir, I can see him doing the great song by Cher. And this is the anthem of hell. You want to know what it is? <laughs> I, I can hear them now. As the helicopters fly over here, I'm, I'm real close to the flight path of Reagan Airport. You're going to hear jets flying over. Elvis used to sing, I'm leaving on a jet plane. Yeah. Walk a mile in my shoes. Elvis songs are just going through my mind. He had a, he had a plane that he called the Lisa Marie. Taking care of business. Oh, yeah. But I can hear the Hellfire 
and Brimstone Choir doing Cher's song. If I could turn back time, if I could find a way, I'd take back those words that hurt you. And you'd say, if I could reach the stars, I'd give them all to you, yeah. If I could turn back time. But look, listen to me. You can't turn back time. There's no second chance. God gives no mulligans. It's appointed a man once to die, and after this, the judgment. There is no second chance. There is no purgatory. No patron saint can get you out of hell. You can't pay or bribe or buy off God to get you out of hell. So we could go on and on and talk about Jim Morrison. Come on, baby, light my. Come on, baby, light my. Come on, baby, light my fire. I'm sure they're doing that one. But the one song they're not doing, the one song the Hellfire Choir is not doing, is the song by John Lennon. Imagine there's no heaven. Oh, no, no, no. They know there's a heaven and they know there's a hell. And they know John Lennon and the Beatles were wrong. You know, as I begin today, what is the worst thing about hell? Anybody have a guess? The worst thing about hell is the Bible says before he condemns you to the doomed dungeons of the dark damned forever. He'll let you see heaven one time. Are you listening to me? He'll let you see heaven one time. He'll take you through the pearly gates, walk on the streets of gold, see the mansion you could have had. Regrets, I've had a few. No one sinned like Sinatra. See the crystal sea. See the very throne of God. See the walls of Jasper. And he'll say to you, According to your works, be done unto you. Depart from me, ye worker of iniquity. I never knew you. And you go to hell, and for all eternity, you'll be thinking, woulda, coulda, shoulda. What could have been? What would have been? If you want to know why I preach against sin, and why I preach hell and wrath and judgment, it's because of that. Now, that was my introduction. I'm sure I've lost 99% of my audience, but that's okay. The 1% of you that are left, glory to God, we can have church. Let's go back in Philippians, and I'm not going to scream and yell and shout and swing from the chandeliers. There's no chandeliers out here. I'm not going to roll on the floor. I'm going I'm to shift down today, and I'm just going to teach calmly. I'm just going to teach, amen, the Word of God, because a lot of y'all have said, you like what I'm saying, but you don't, you don't like the way I'm saying it. So for many of y'all, I'm just going to teach calmly. I'm not going to shout at you. I'm just going to share with you. Now, we're going to shout on, on, on some other videos. We're going to shout. We're going to yell. We're going to scream. I'm not going to stop doing that. But sometimes, I'm going to let the teacher come out. I'm a preacher, but I'm also a teacher. So today, we're going to study Philippians chapter 1, and I'm going to start. Let's start in verse 8. We covered verses 1 to 7 in a previous message. Go back in the archives and watch it. But let's start today in verse 8. God is my record how greatly I long after you all. Paul didn't say y'all. He wasn't from the south. He said you all, like a Yankee. That's okay. <laughs> in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Now let's stop right there. Some people say ignorantly, well, the Bible says, judge not. Well, <laughs> the same Bible that says, judge not, lest you be judged, also says that, that we should have all judgment. There's, there's good judgment, which you ought to have, and bad judgment that you should not participate in. But understand that the Bible teaches us to judge righteous judgment. And then he goes on in verse 10 and he says that you, talking to you, for you, talk, uh, you, I'm not talking about your neighbor, your friend, your mom, your dad, your husband, your wife, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your kids. We're talking about you. The Bible is God speaking to you. That you may approve the things that are excellent and disapprove the things that aren't. 
that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense. Listen to that. Without offense. Think of that. Until the day of Christ. Let me ask you a question as we begin today. Are you without offense? How is your life? Have you examined yourself? The Bible says, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith. As a matter of fact, Paul told the Corinthians that you should judge yourself. Yeah, the Bible teaches proper judgment. Judge yourself so you don't be judged and condemned with the world. Is your life without offense? And then he goes on in verse 11. He says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. But I would, you should understand, brethren, that the things that have happened to me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel. I get a kick out of the fact that the biggest preachers in America, and I don't exaggerate, household names, media preachers, TV preachers, megachurch pastors, household names, they all got together and they tried their best to destroy me. They blocked me, they defrocked me, they ghosted me. They did everything they could to destroy me a year or so ago, but their blocking me backfired. Glory to God, and I don't fear them. You can't block God the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. And I'm anointed by God the Holy Ghost. And you can block me. You can try. But God's going to wake you up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And my words are going to haunt you. My words are going to wake you. are going to dream about me. You're going to have visions about me. You're going to hear this crazy preacher of Pentecost in the middle of the night. Hallelujah to the Lamb of Almighty God. You can't block. You can't ghost God the Holy Ghost. So that my bonds, they put Paul in prison. Can you think about that? They put Paul in prison. The, the writer of Philippians, the writer of 14 epistles, the greatest apostle, they put him in prison. But God knew what he was doing. Hallelujah. There's a price to pay. There's persecution. There's a cost to the cross. So that my bonds are manifest in all places and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by, by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. The, the two words that describe evangelist Mike Dial more than any other are confidence. I'm not cocky, but I'm confident and bold. I'm not afraid. I don't fear men. I don't try to please men. I'm not afraid of what men are going to do. I'm bold. I'm confident. Why? Because I know my message is right, and I know who I serve, and I know I'm anointed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that my preaching will inspire confidence and boldness in you, and that the spirit of fear that controls many of you will be broken by the power of Almighty God. You don't need to be necoed or controlled by anything except God, the Holy Ghost. No spirit of fear should rule your life. Glory to God. Not a spirit of fear, but a spirit of faith and freedom should rule your life. Speak the word of God without fear. Verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ, listen very closely, even of envy and strife. The one preach Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love, knowing that I am set, I love this phrase, for the defense of the gospel. I am set for the defense of the gospel. Oftentimes, I'm an evangelist, but I have to act like an apologist. What, what does that mean? It means that you defend the faith. Jude tells us in verse 3, the little book of Jude, there's only one chapter. So Jude verse 3, it says that we are to earnestly contend, fight or strive for the faith once delivered to the saints. 1 Timothy 6 says we are to fight the good fight of faith. We are to stand for the defense of the gospel and proper doctrine. And that's why I do what I do. That's why I have to name the names of false teachers and false prophets. I don't hate these people. I love them. I forgive them. I pray for them. But public error has to be corrected publicly. And the United States of America today had better forget about national defense and spending billions, even trillions of dollars on defense because ultimately there's no defense against the wrath of God. Romans 1, uncle, my uncle Daryl at Daryl Dial Zero, at Daryl Dial Zero on TikTok, you should follow him, is now teaching a series on the book of Romans. And in Romans 1.18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness. You better believe it is. 
You can't sin and get away with it. There's no discretion in heaven. There's no privacy or secrecy. Be sure your sin will find you out, America. So instead of focusing on national defense and the Pentagon, you need to start worrying about the defense of the gospel. I live, as a matter of fact, if you go that way, two miles, is the Pentagon. I live two miles from the Pentagon and Arlington National Cemetery. I know what I'm talking about. But look, the power of Pentecost and the power of the blood of the Savior is our defense. That is America's defense, not the power of the Pentagon, not billions of dollars that we spend on weapons systems. We need to learn, as my uncle at Daryl Dial Zero teaches, the art of spiritual warfare. Because only that can save America. Not Donald Trump, not, no, not a mere mortal sinful man can save America, but only Jesus Christ and spiritual warfare can save America. The con of the military defense contractors cannot save America. I like what Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 10. He says there, he says, I don't exist to be a man pleaser. Jesus is the real thing. And Coca-Cola did not pay me for this endorsement. But Jesus Christ is the real thing. Amen. It's a hot day today. Praise God. It's a good day to preach on hell. You should never preach on hell when it's snowing outside. People want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a feeble attempt at humor. Joel Osteen says, I like to start with something funny. If you can't beat them, join them. I'll try to start with something funny too. The problem is people don't laugh at my jokes. They don't get my humor like they get Joel. <laughs> anyway, it's a good day to preach on hell. But look, very seriously, Paul said, I don't exist to please men. I'm not a men pleaser. I exist to please God. If you go back and read there in Galatians 1, 6 to 10, we won't have time to go there. But you'll see that I'm not trying to craft a message because the polls tell me what I should preach. I don't preach that which is trending, that which is tracking, that which is popular. I preach for one reason, not to be popular, but to populate heaven. And Paul here is talking about his peers and his contemporaries and his colleagues in the ministry, and it's not flattering. Did you read the text? Envy, strife, contention, not sincerely. It's a terrible picture. But before we go there, let me just preface it by saying this. I don't see my preacher peers, contemporaries and colleagues, as competitors. I'm not competing with anybody. Amen. Competition is not Christian. I don't see him as competition. Amen. I have no envy, no strife, and no contention in my life. My purpose is not to please you. It is only to please God. We got all these mega churches today. We got all these holy wars. We got all these fundraising wars. We got all these worship wars. That's not my world. Amen. God never called anyone anywhere, anytime to practice church growth, but only to preach the cross. When you get obsessed with numbers, you become numb. Now, let's look at what Paul said. Because you see, God, the Bible says in Hebrews, God is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, and it, it actually defines the motives of the heart. What are the motives of the big ministries today? What are the motivations of the mass media ministries and mega churches? Well, it's the same thing as the politicians that they look to. A, number one, to please people. They're, they're like a good entertainer. They just give the people what they want, just like Elvis. Just give the people what they want. Give the, that's, not, that's what an entertainer does, but that's not what an evangelist does. Amen. Number two, all they do today is they follow polls and surveys. I, the only poll 
I care about is the pole that Jesus hung and bled and died on. The only survey I care about is surveying the wondrous cross when I survey the wondrous cross. And number three, as I just said, they entertain. They give the people what they want. Well, I don't tell you what you want to hear at Evangelist Mike Dial. I'll tell you what you need to hear. Number four, they're about envy. They're wanting to be like the world. They follow the styles, the trends, the fads, the fashion of the world. And number five, they're about strife. They're always fighting in the flesh. They're fighting. Republicans are fighting with Democrats. Democrats are fighting with Republicans. The rich are fighting with the poor. Right on down the line. But that's not our war. That's not our war. That's in the flesh, not in the faith. And number six, they're about contention. In other words, they're always competing. They're always about numbers. My church is bigger than your church. I don't care how many people you have in your church. Stephen Furtick, Craig Groeschel, come on now, Rich Wilkerson Jr., Joel Osteen, Pastor Houston, Houston, we have a problem, Hillsong, Elevation Church. I don't care. I don't give three bent pens. How many people you have in your church? Is even one of them saved? Probably not. Because you're not preaching the Word of God. You're preaching worldliness. You're not preaching holiness. You just got holes in your jeans. You got your sunglasses on. You preach with your hat backwards. You got tattoos all up and down your arms. You got tattoos, but you don't have truth. Always fighting. Always trying to get bigger. Well, God hates building programs. Amen. And number seven, they have no honesty, sincerity, or integrity. Truth has vanished, evening shadows. And eighth and finally, they operate, they minister in pretense, not in true preaching, and not in true prayer. They operate in total shame. They're shameless, like Garth Brooks says. I'm shameless. They're shameless. They are ashamed. But I'm not that way. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed. I'm not walking in shame. I'm not hanging my head in shame. They are shameless without shame. They accept no blame. And they fear only men. Now let's go to verse 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed. And yet today, the modern church, it's shame. Because it, why? why? Why is it in shame? Because it, it adopts the world's words, it adopts the world's methods, the world's fashions. It talks like the world, it dresses like the world, it acts like the world, it walks like the world, it imitates the world, it copies the world, it has contemporary music, contemporary worship, it follows the world's politics, the world's purpose, the world's psychology. That's a shame. Shame on you. Shame on you preachers that are preaching that. Shame on you. But that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. Whether by life or by death. Let's lighten it up for a moment. There's another big movie out right now. As I hear all these planes flying by, Washington, there's a lot of military bases around. I think of Tom Cruise and, and Top Gun, Maverick. But look, Tom Cruise... Brad Pitt, George Clooney, every movie star I could name, I could name a bunch of them. Y'all need to listen to me, movie stars. There's only one star in this universe, and if you're receiving praise or applause or attention or worship or money by being an electronic image and likeness and icon worshipped by billions, you're not on the right path. Tom Cruise and all the others... They are just cruising and boozing their way to hell in their vanity, their plastic surgery, their cosmetic surgery, and their money. There are no top guns in hell. You need to understand this. There are no top guns in hell. You're not going to be top. You're going to be the bottom. 
There are no stars in hell. There are no celebrities in hell. There's no party in hell. There's no happy hour in hell. There's no hookups in hell. There's no hedonism in hell. And all who follow Disney or Universal or Pixar or Paramount are doomed to the dark dungeons of the damned forever. I don't beat around the bush. I give you straight talk. Now let's get to my to the heart of my text. Now really, this has really been on my heart. Verse 21. I think this is some of the greatest words that the Apostle Paul ever said. And, and I'm busting hypocrisy and self-righteousness. A lot of people claim, oh, I love Paul, I love the Bible, I'm born again, I'm a Christian, but they don't really like Paul. Because when push, when push comes to shove, they reject Paul. Oh, he was for that generation, he was for that society, he was for that culture, he's not for today. Yeah, he's for today. Paul is for today. Paul is an apostle for today, for right now. And he says, for me to live is Christ. For me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Now the Spirit of God gave me the, the next word, the next line I'm going to give to you, and I'm gonna, I want to give it to you accurately. If Jesus Christ is just a part of your life, you're not saved. Now rewind and listen to that a hundred times. Close your eyes. Because images, and especially my ugly face, ain't going to save anybody. Movies and TV and TikTok videos, they ain't going to save anybody. Close your eyes, rewind, and listen to that a hundred times. And it'll make sense. Let me say it again. If Jesus Christ is just a part of your life, you're not saved. But, however, however, if Jesus Christ is, it's the biggest little word in the Bible, if Jesus Christ is your life, you are saved. Furthermore, he said to die is gain. Now think of that, it's radical, that's revolutionary, that's extremist, but it's true, it's Pauline theology. If you are afraid to die, you're not saved. The Hebrews says Jesus destroyed the one who had, past tense, the power of death, that is the devil, by his blood of the cross. But if you're afraid to die, you're not saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are, are you listening to me? Are you following me? Life is... And salvation has come to your heart, home, and hands if Jesus Christ is truly the Lord of all your life and if Jesus is your life. I am crucified with Christ, Galatians 2.20. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. You see, I have died, but Christ lives in me, Galatians 2.20. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Jesus is not a part of your life, a hobby, a pastime, a part-time Savior. He is your life. And only then are you saved. My gain is not in the now. My reward is not in the now. It is in death. But beyond that, true believers can't even really die. In John chapter 11, 25 and 26, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Glory to God. Glory to God. And even if you die, you'll live. But then he went on to say, he that believeth on me shall never die. Death is simply a transition. Go rid of God. It's passed away. It is a transition from this world to the next. Hallelujah to the Lamb. The key, so, so there's no fear in death. And that's how the devil holds the world in a spirit of fear. Because you're afraid of death. But the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, delivers you from the spirit of fear. That's a good place to shout amen. Praise God. I'm not destined for hell. I'm not destined for a coffin. Glory be to Almighty God. I'm not destined to be cremated. Glory to God. I'm destined for the throne of Almighty God. Revelation 3.21 blows my mind. Apple doesn't blow my mind. But the Word of God blows my mind. You know what Jesus said, Revelation 3.21? He said, He who overcomes, He who overcomes sin and Satan, the world system, the flesh, the devil, 
he who overcomes shall I grant to sit with me in my throne. It's epi, in or on my throne. Glory, think about that. Glory to God. In Jesus Christ, we are destined for the throne. I should get up and shout. I should get up and run around this porch and balcony right now. I'm destined for the throne of Almighty God. I'm talking about destiny. Destined for the throne. So that this world has nothing to offer evangelist Mike Dial. I don't need your money, your liquor, your booze, your whiskey, your wine, your women, your gambling, your hookups, your fornication, your pornography, your tobacco, your cigarettes. I don't need your prescription medications. I don't need that. I have all I need. Jesus is everything I need and I am complete in him. And he is the head. Man, I tell you what, glory to God. So what is your destiny? For me to live as Christ and to die as gain. For I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Oh my, that's shouting ground. That's enough to make a Presbyterian shout. That's enough to make an Episcopalian shout. It's better. We have a better covenant based on better promises. Oh, get up and shout. We have a better covenant based on better promises. And, and, and when he says, I have a desire to part and be with Christ, which is better, what does that mean? It means that the true disciple, the true believer wants nothing this world has to offer. Boy, that'll put a smile on your face. The joy of the Lord, peace that passes all understanding. My God, Philippians 4.19, shall supply all my need according to his riches and glory. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm a new creation. I'm the righteousness of God. I want nothing that Elon Musk or Donald Trump or Bill Gates or Jeffrey Bezos or Mark Zuckerberg or Warren Buffett has to sell. I don't want anything from Amazon Prime. I don't want anything from Electronic Commerce. I don't want anything from the mall. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. The true believer has something better, something bigger, and something bolder. We don't need the big bad beast, the Antichrist, and his bullying, his bragging, his boasting, and his business prowess. We don't need that. We don't need that. We don't need that. Glory to God. <laughs> I'm going to stop for now and we're going to take a break and we'll pick this up in our next time together. I've, I've enjoyed having you with me today from just outside Washington, D.C. This is Evangelist Mike Dahl telling you I love you. Jesus loves you. And remember, Jesus is still your answer. Amen and amen. God bless you today.